Heart Failure Medications, Part 2, Traditional Agents. In Part 2, we're going to be talking about traditional drug therapies used for heart failure. In the last installment, we talked about how important it is to understand the neurohormonal pathways that are activated in heart failure. We discussed the influence of the sympathetic nervous system, the RAS system, and other hormones to initially maintain adequate blood pressure and fluid retention. However, further activation of the neurohormonal system eventually becomes deleterious to the body and ultimately worsens the heart failure. As we will discuss more in depth, we will see the various points in the neurohormonal system where drugs can be used to block continued activation. The cornerstone of guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure involves neurohormonal antagonism. That means inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system, inhibition of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and augmentation of other favorable pathways. Contemporary understanding of the advancement in medications for heart failure leads us to identify three important drug therapy classes. All patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction should be treated with an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or angiotensin II receptor blocker, plus an evidence-based beta blocker, plus spironolactone. However, despite well-published goals for guideline-directed medical therapy, patients with heart failure in usual care settings are often undertreated. Looking at registry data of heart failure patients, only 75 to 80 percent of patients are taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs, 66 to 86 percent are taking a beta blocker, and only 34 to 50 percent are taking a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. Also, even when prescribed, Doses are often below recommended targets. Evidence shows that doses below target levels are associated with poorer patient outcomes. As we will discuss more in depth, we will see the various points in the neurohormonal system where drugs can be used to block continued activation. Beta blockers can be used to block the sympathetic nervous system and catecholamine release. ACE inhibitors can block the conversion of angiotensin I to angiotensin II. ARBs can block the effects of angiotensin II at the receptor level. And mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists can block the effects of aldosterone. First, let's talk about ACE inhibitors and ARBs. The use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs blocks the deleterious effects of angiotensin II namely vasoconstriction and the release of aldosterone and ADH. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are the drugs of choice for initial therapy of heart failure, even in patients with relatively mild left ventricular systolic dysfunction. ACE inhibitors and ARBs improve symptoms, decreases the incidence of hospitalization due to heart failure, and prolongs survival in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Numerous studies have shown that antagonizing the RAS system using either ACE inhibitors or ARBs reduces morbidity and mortality in heart failure, with reductions in all-cause mortality in the range of 20 to 30 percent. Drugs with vasodilating properties are a primary treatment for heart failure. Arterial dilation provides symptomatic relief of heart failure by decreasing afterload. The target dosages for some commonly used ACE inhibitors and ARBs include enalapril 10 to 20 mg twice a day, lisinopril 20 to 40 mg per day, or valsartan 160 mg twice a day. Common side effects seen with ACE inhibitors and ARBs include cough, commonly seen with ACE inhibitors, angioedema, hyperkalemia, hypotension, and ACE inhibitors and ARBs should be avoided in pregnancy because it increases the risk of fetal renal failure and death. Question, why do some patients taking ACE inhibitors develop a cough? What can the patient take instead? Answer, the lung contains large amounts of angiotensin converting enzyme. Not only is angiotensin converting enzyme involved in the metabolism of angiotensin one, 
but it also metabolizes an inflammatory peptide named bradykinin. Bradykinin is metabolized by angiotensin converting enzymes, so ACE inhibitors can cause a pulmonary accumulation of bradykinin, resulting in a drug-induced cough. A local accumulation of bradykinin may lead to activation of pro-inflammatory peptides, for example, substance P, neuropeptide Y, and a local release of histamine. The patient can be switched from an ACE inhibitor to an ARB. Angiotensin receptor blockers do not affect bradykinin, so they can be used for those who cannot tolerate ACE inhibitor-induced cough. Beta blockers can be used to block the deleterious effects of norepinephrine on the heart. Beta blockers improve long-term symptoms and clinical outcomes, reduces the rates of heart failure, hospitalization, and death in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Extended release metoprolol succinate, carvedilol, and bisoprolol are FDA approved for use in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. These evidence-based beta blockers should be prescribed to all patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as first-line agents, unless contraindicated or unable to tolerate the treatment. Metoprolol and bisoprolol are both partially selective beta-1 blockers, and carvedilol is a mixed alpha-1 and non-selective beta-blocking agent. Some target doses for FDA-approved beta blockers are metoprolol XL, 100 milligrams twice a day, carvedilol, 25 milligrams twice a day, and bisoprolol, 10 milligrams once a day. Beta blocker side effects can include bradycardia, heart block, bronchospasm, bisoprolol, metoprolol may cause less due to beta-1 selectivity, and hypotension. Carvedilol may cause more due to alpha blocking activity. The mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist spironolactone blocks the deleterious effects of aldosterone. Guidelines recommend that a mineralocorticoid antagonist be considered for all patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction without severe renal impairment. They reduce the risk of hospitalization and death in patients with heart failure. The mineraloreceptor antagonist spironolactone and eprenolone contribute to renin angiotensin aldosterone system blockade. They reduce mortality by 15 to 30 percent in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and reduce heart failure hospitalizations by 15 to 40 percent. Target doses for these drugs are spironolactone 25 milligrams daily or twice a day, aprenolone 25 to 50 milligrams once a day. A key side effect for these medications is hyperkalemia, so potassium levels must be followed very closely, as well as renal function. Fluid retention and antiandrogenic effects can occur, and these drugs should be avoided in pregnancy. So all patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction should be treated with a three-drug regimen angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or angiotensin 2 receptor blocker plus an evidence-based beta blocker plus spironolactone. But wait, there's more! We need to talk about Secubitril, a neprilysin inhibitor. Secubitril inhibits the enzyme neprilysin, which is responsible for the degradation of atrial and B natriuretic peptides two natriuretic and vasoactive peptides that work mainly by reducing blood pressure and volume. Here you can see BMP is metabolized by the enzyme neprilysin to inactive products. We give a drug named Secubitril to block neprilysin and so BMP levels will increase. B-type natriuretic peptide or BMP is a natural hormone that's produced by the ventricular myocardium in response to elevations of end diastolic pressure and volume. The net effect of BMP in the body is to cause peripheral and coronary vasodilation, 
thus decreasing preload and afterload. BMP also has diuretic or natriuretic properties with improved renal blood flow and glomerular filtration resulting from afferent arterial dilation. BMP also blocks the effects of aldosterone and vasopressin. The favorable effects of BMP are enhanced by inhibiting neprilysin, the enzyme that degrades BMP, by using secubitril. When secubitril is combined with an ARB, it becomes a combination drug consisting of two antihypertensives, Valsartan and secubitril. Valsartan secubitril's brand name is Entresto. This combination is often referred to as an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, or ARNI. The American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and Heart Failure Society of America guidelines recommend ARB neprilysin inhibitor therapy as a first-line alternative to ACE inhibitors for those with symptomatic heart failure who are not hypotensive or intolerant of angiotensin system antagonists. This recommendation was based on the PARADIGM trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in September of 2014. The trial involved 8,442 heart failure patients with the New York Heart Association class 2 to 4 and ejection fractions less than or equal to 40%. The trial compared enalapril 10 milligrams twice a day to valsartan secubitril 200 milligrams twice a day. The duration of the study lasted for 24 months and it was stopped early because of positive results. Results showed a 20% risk reduction in the death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization for heart failure, as well as a 16% risk reduction in overall mortality. Valsartan is an angiotensin receptor blocker. Secubitril inhibits the enzyme neprilysin, which is responsible for degradation of atrial and brain natriuretic peptides. These peptides lower blood pressure and reduce blood volume. The indication is to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in adult patients with chronic heart failure. It goes by the trade name of Entresto, manufactured by Novartis. The starting dose is 49 milligrams of secubitril and 51 milligrams of Valsartan twice a day with a target maintenance dose of 97 over 103 milligrams twice a day. Reduce the dose in renal and hepatic insufficiency. And a washout period of 36 hours is necessary when you transition from an ACE inhibitor to an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor to avoid angioedema. The price per month is about $600. Side effects of Valsartan secubitril include the following. Hypotension, 14% versus 9.2% in enalapril-treated patients, with p-value of 0 0.001. More serious angioedema was seen in Valsartan secubitril patients, 0.5% versus 0.2%. Neprilysin breaks down bradykinin, so inhibition of secubitril will increase bradykinin which can lead to angioedema. Secubitril, Valsartan secubitril had less hyperkalemia, renal failure, and cough than the enalapril group. Neprilysin also degrades amyloid beta peptide, so inhibition can potentially lead to accumulation and deposition of amyloid plaques leading to Alzheimer's disease. In the eye, macular degeneration can occur and avoid in pregnancy as Valsartan can increase the risk of fetal renal failure and death. For those already tolerating an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, guidelines recommend transitioning to an ARNI to achieve mortality benefit. However, the estimated monthly cost for secubitril Valsartan is $600, so prohibitive costs and challenges with insurance coverage for these newer medications are current obstacles that must be weighed against the benefits. Question, why not give secubitril by itself? Answer, 
Neprilysin is an enzyme that also degrades angiotensin II, so inhibiting it with secubitril will increase angiotensin II levels. Therefore, secubitril must be combined with an ACE inhibitor or ARB. To summarize, we previously discussed the use of triple drug therapy to treat heart failure and where their antagonism occurs in the neurohormonal system. We listed the target doses and key side effects when ACE inhibitors and ARBs, beta blockers, and spironolactone are used to treat heart failure. We explained the mechanism of the neprilysin inhibitor secubitril and how its addition provides additional benefit based on the PARADIGM trial. And we listed five drug counseling points for valsartan secubitril or entresto that should be discussed to a patient prescribed the drug. Coming up next in part two of this series, we'll state which type of heart failure patient will benefit most from the addition of evabradine based on the SHIFT trial. We'll explain why vasopressin receptor antagonists are not recommended for heart failure patients. We'll identify which group of patients would benefit most from the addition of hydralazine and isosorbide, and we'll define the current role of the use of digoxin and diuretics in heart failure. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEZ Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comments section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.